work of this session is, has been cutting out because unfortunately we are at this to be with us, so we have to waste more time. Bruno will present our work on the concept of mental energy. We will focus on that song. And we have to have a time. He will present his work on the uh, objects of mind. And uh, I am this right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, his focus will be on the Germany uh, experimental psychology between 86 and 1915. But still, you represented uh, your work in. in yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, so take your time. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't have time. I don't need all the time. So <laughs> anyone, I'll, I'll feel free to go to the other panel. I like, will take a question uh, after if you want to go to the second half of the book. Uh, yeah. So uh, the, the theme of my talk today, as as Massimilian uh, was saying, uh, it's something that I, uh, it's part of a larger research project uh, <coughs> called Energizing the Mind, which I started and I presented uh, in greater length uh, the, the project on its own uh, at Ash's conference last year in Berlin. Uh, to sum it up, the project as a whole, quite concisely, uh, I try to explore the assimilation of concepts of force and energy and other associated concepts such as work, power, lease, and uh, uh, you know, lease. in the psychological sciences of the mid 19th to early 20th century. And I try to do that, I'm trying to do that by a, a transnational comparative approach. So I did do Vienna. The Viennese context, which I kind of focused a little bit more last year, now it's in print under here. Uh, and I will, now this, at this section, this next side segment of my research, I focus on German experimental psychology. But to sum it up very concisely, but, uh, 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 so after the, the, the discovery of the law of uh, conservation of energy in the 1840s by a variety of researchers, and the scientific event whose wild impact was only matched in the 19th century by evolutionary theory, virtually all sciences were forced to contend with its consequences, including the new psychological sciences, by which I include amongst them uh, experimental psychology, neurophysiology, psychiatry, psychoanalysis, and others. Within the wider context of crisis and fragmentation of science in the 19th century, I argue, the concept of energy allowed for the unification of matter, life, the mind, and society by providing a single common currency capable of being circulated within widely different domains. Not just psychology, but all of the human sciences, the physical sciences, the biological sciences, and further. Uh, as well as of being further assimilated together with various local tradition and accepted practices by formulating energetic concepts specifically adapted to each particular field in psychology, psychic forces, psychological energy, mental energy, and others. So I aim to compare how this global paradigm, the energetic paradigm, was locally received by different authors and traditions, reflecting the specific, in most cases by specific, I mean national, because at that time, disciplines were national, nationally institutionalized by regulations, laws, institutions, and so on. So, reflecting the specific practices, purposes, and institutions. And again, we have already started uh, uh, going on Vienna. If anyone wants, they can send the, the paper. So one main goal of the project is that of exploring the role played by the energetic paradigm, which I believe has not only shaped the objects of study of psychology, but allows their, their emergence as epistemic objects. Uh, Kurt Danziger and Lorraine Dawson separately kind of pointed that out, even if they didn't make a specific argument regarding the, 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 how will emerge within that paradigm, like how the concept of force allowed the emergence of will as a concept. Uh, further, I'm also interested in investigating how energetics allow different authors to conceive of the boundaries of their science precisely at a time when psychology starts to become institutionalized. Wilhelm Wirtheit, for example, 
proposed this framework as a distinguishing marker between the what he called the descript descriptive psychology, concerning the lived experience, the reflective awareness, and the explanatory psychology, which, in his words, seeks to explain the constitution of the psychic life with the help of its components, energies, and law. A distinction that he would later re-elaborate the dividing line between the natural and the human sciences. Although not a psychologist, due, due to his demarcation, his telling of its time and reflects analogous attempts of tracing the boundaries of psychology. Uh, some, like Dutai, use energy as a concept of demarcation between different types of psychology. Uh, the descriptive and explanatory psychology, for example. Others conceive energy conservation as a demarcation between the realms of physiology and of psychology, whereas for the more explicitly materialist, there was a continuum by which energy could serve as this continued concept between the two realms. For many, however, there existed a special type of energy characteristic of mental phenomena, psychic energy, that constituted the central object of study of psychology as a human science. One prominent example of this process took place in German experimental psychology at the turn of the century. Although I'll dedicate a bit more attention to the work of Wundt, this is merely a methodological choice with a lack of time here. My focus is rather in exploring how energy conservation, if for not only the objective, the object of psychology, and thus the limits of the science, uh, well, this is shot, but also how it helped sciences, scientists to negotiate its limits as a discipline, the fact or as a discipline in German during its initial process of institutionalization. As we know, the years 1850 and 1900 saw the emergence of psychology as a discipline in German universities, not psychology as a science, which already existed at least in the 18th century, but psychology as a discipline. This process, for reasons explored in greater length by Mai Wegener in a really interesting uh, paper she wrote on uh, psychological parallelism was simultaneous with the emergence of psychophysical parallelism as the most advanced conception of the relation between psyche and physics between 1850 and 1900. Psychophysical parallelism was defended in different formats by figures such as Evan Herring, Mark, Fashioner, Wundt, Willis Jackson, Bergson, we can go on and on and on, and virtually ubiquitous this as a concept amongst uh, psychological authors of the period. Herring for one suggested that it consisted the, the, the condition sine qua non that any research can be conducted in psychology, while the late Wundt, specifically the late Wundt, not the early Wundt, maintained that parallelism is not a fundamental principle, but the fundamental principle of psychology. It is the only principle at its disposal. Although the many available versions of psychophysical parallelism diverge to a vast degree, one reason that made it such a prominent uh, position to the age old mind problem at the time was its apparent solution to the problem of the closeness of natural causality. Uh, a problem that was a thing that, an element that was implicit in the law of energy conservation, or at least that was the understanding of many of the psychological authors. If you read their handbooks at the time, they will be talking, there will be at least one chapter about that. About, uh, Causation, the problem of clo the closeness of natural causality. Uh, researchers involved in the discovery of energy conservation, such as Helmholtz and Meyer, had emphasized the impossibility of a perpetual model. Nothing is created, nothing is lost. There is only a quantifiable exchange from one form of energy to another, and whichever forces act upon a body must also be accompanied by the equivalent conversion from another form of energy. And in an organism, primarily, this form of energy arrives via the consumption of foodstuffs. In sum, only matter acts on matter, therefore leaving no room for the causal effect of non-physical forces, such as either vital or mental forces. For defenders of psychophysical parallelism, however, mental processes were not constrained by physical processes, but only concomitant to it. Psycho psychological and psych physiological events run in parallel always accompanying one another, but never interacting. 
This allowance ecological phenomena to be investigated independently of its simultaneous physiological processes, and also, of course, also allowing the autonomy of uh, psychology as a discipline, of psychology to have uh, its own form of psychological causation. Although the doctrine of parallelism can be traced back to the works of Spinoza and Leibniz, the modern psychophysical parallelism found, found its origins in the work of Mr. Fashion. In 1823, in his Habilitation uh, uh, dissertation, Fashioner had already defended parallelism between the Zele and Corpo or, and body. So in the body. In 1851, Zenda Vesta, he defended a parallelism between the body and the mind, the Geist. It was, however, with the publication of Elements of Psychophysics in 1860 that psychophysical parallelism came to prominence. Fashion proposed there a type of monism whereby the, the physical and the psychical are understood as two expressions of the same underlying substance, so that the mind and the body are seen as the two sides of the same coin, a position that later altered the type of dual aspect monism. Along those lines, Fashioner would thus claim that, in a quote, the living force that is used for chopping wood and the living force that is used for thinking are not only quantitatively comparable, but can be converted into one another, so that both performances can be physically measured by a common scale. This is also interesting when you, if you study, think of uh, Fashioner working in a, a psychological measurement, where he's measuring, psycholo where he's measuring psychologically, he's also measuring physically. Those, along those lines. It's a physical force that is measuring. There are two expressions of the same force. Uh, physical, and physical and psychical forces run in parallel, two manifestations of the same underlying substance. Physiologists contemporary to Fashioner, such as Helmholtz and Dubois Hamon, had instead defended a dualist view and the position of psychophysical interaction <coughs> rather than parallelism between the mind and the body. This despite the fact that they are commonly uh, understood as materialists, but it's really not specifically the case, but especially if you think of their psychology. The I in Helmholtz's empirical theory of perception functions as a synthesizer and an organizer of experience, which is neither material nor constrained by conservative law. Many commentators, and I cite some of them there, uh, in fact noted the, uh, the idealist and even Christian elements in his thinking of where the, what is the I exactly in Helmholtz. It's something that he never fully specific, specifically touches. While in Dubois Raymond's famously listed consciousness as a problem lying beyond the limits of science, which indicated that consciousness, in his view, lies not only beyond the sphere of activity of the sciences, but beyond the realm of natural phenomena. Uh, same problem with free will as well, where he also leads free will as something else, also along those lines. As some scholars have argued, and I cite uh, Anderson and Wilkenstein, rather than an admission of defeat by natural science, as the, the uh, Dubois Himmel's essays have been uh, at described as, you know, usually in the history of science they say that his attribution of a limit to science it means a, a, an ultimate failure of science itself. It's not, a, it's not an admission of a failure of science for the Guarimo, according to those authors, to those commentators, but they should be rather interpreted as an attempt to protect the boundaries of natural science against the perceived threat coming from both the Geisterwissenschaften and from mysticism. For authors like Fashion and Bunt, who sought to turn psychology into a science, this demarcation was not tenable. In his early work, written mostly while working as Helmholtz's assistant in Heidelberg, Wundt argued for the identity between sensations <coughs> and the mechanical processes of the nerves, which for him worked according to the conservative law. Uh, if you read the lecture 5 to 10, 12 of the lectures on human animal minds, he traced a direct relation between the energy, the energy law uh, to the qualities of sensation, like the, and it's a continuum process uh, for Wundt there. By 1874, when he publishes the first edition of Grundzüge, the, the Principles, uh, 
this started to change. This is what uh, Araujo, uh, Salvo Araujo, uh, called his phase of transition, but he is not explicitly against it yet. Uh, although he doesn't really openly criticize his own earlier views of the subject, he did dedicate a chapter to a critique of the use of force in both psychology there. He critiques the use of force by both. Uh, it was not until 1880 in his uh, logic that Wundt would openly, and shortly after in ethics as well, uh, he would openly criticize his own earlier views, proposing instead what he called the law of the growth of mental energy as the mental analog of the law of physical energy conservation. Growth there was linked to Wundt's principle of creative synthesis, the doctrine that mental causation, unlike physical causation, it's like the results of a physical, of a psychical process is always creative and greater than the sum of its elements. So any psychical process is not constrained by conservative laws. It's always creative. There's always something new creative in the process. So it's never a conservative process. It's always a creative process. It's always a process that generates growth. And he creates that as a, as a, as a mental analog to the process of <coughs> to the process of physical causation. And finally, in the fifth edition of the principles in his principles of psychology, his mature phase, uh, Bunt would then defend that it's never possible to arrive by way of a molecular mechanics at any sort of psychical quality or process. Psychical processes refuse to submit to any of our physical measures of energy. And the physical molecular processes, so far as we are able to follow them, are seen to be transformed variously enough into one another, but never directly into psychical qualities. So we can therefore say that Wundt moved from an early explicitly materialistic project to an anti-materialism in his mature work, while in both stages making central use of the concept of energy to conceive of the object of psychology. And this is, I think, quite interesting. The Energy never changes. Like energy as a concept stays there, but as the paradigm, even though it's, it's a faith completely out there. His work, his work provides a poignant example that illustrates the diversity of ways in which these concepts were used at the time, even changing drastically in the work of a single author, but, all, but always keeping the concept of energy as a central object of the investigation of psychology. <coughs> After a period, an initial phase when psychophysical parallelism obtained nearly ubiquitous acceptance by psychological researchers, criticism started to appear around 1895, I'll say. I'm not yet fully certain that this was indeed the case, and if anyone knows, uh, has better information on that, please let me know. Uh, but I'm trying to trace a little bit that, that history as well. Where it seems like this event, this criticism of uh, uh, of psychophysical parallelism was triggered by Carl Stump's opening address at the Third Congress of Psychology held in Munich in 1896 under his presidency. Uh, and Stump interestingly uh, also gave a course at the University of Berlin, uh, I think in 1898, uh, specifically on uh, what's called Leibniz Zeller, so the body and the soul, mind, and the problem of conservation of energy. And it was the course was attended by pretty much most of like the later Gestalt psychology uh, authors. Um, <clears throat> so this congress is a monumental event in the history of psychology, counting with much of the elites of the psychological sciences in the audience. Stuck's address, later published as an essay titled Life on Zille was dedicated to conducting a scathing critique of psychophysical parallelism. Although the main target of his criticism was Ernst Mach's uh, analysis of sensation, the content applied to much of the contemporary German experimental psychology, and in particular to fashion and wounds. In short, Stumpf argued that psychophysical parallelism was an untenable position, since it did not allow for the will uh, to have any causal effects on the body, nor for bodily experiences to, ex to impact the mind. Thus leading to the absurd view that, and I quote, the psychic world is completely unaffected, irrelevant to the process and development of the physical. The, organism, the, the organisms live and act, people found states, 
write poems, hold congresses, driven by purely physical forces, just as if no thinking, feeling, and wanting existed. Close quote. For Stum, psychophysical parallelism inevitably led to a dualist position that he violently rejected, even though uh, the psychophysical parallelism, at least for fashion, was a monist position. Uh, the view that he proposed there, and then he later articulated in his the book that was later, uh, I think was possibly published, and it's called uh, Can't We Still Eat? Uh, Theory of Knowledge, is a type of monism whereby the cosmos, that as a whole, is composed not only of physical energy, but of both physical and psychic energy. So the conservative law applies not only to physical energy, but to the totality of the physical and psychic energies of the universe, which do interact and can be converted into one another. Despite the harsh criticisms uh, of contemporary experimental psychology, energy yet again features as a central concept used to articulate a suitable position to the mind-body problem. <coughs> Whether or not directly led by Stuhl Stock, uh, a range of publications started appearing uh, dedicated to criticizing parallelism while centrally using energy conservation in their argumentative strategy and often citing uh, Stuhl's lecture as well. Thus, for a brief moment at the turn of the century, the old materi materialism strike took on the shape of a parallelism strike. The first word directly that I could find, and even citing uh, uh, Stumstock, is Max Wenschner, uh, 1896. It's called, I'll translate, uh, on, on psychical and, uh, and physical and psychical causality and the principle of psychophysical parallelism. Uh, it's, pu it, it's published even before the proceeds of the conference, and it's already tackles uh, directly uh, Stumpf position there uh, uh, in stock. And it's also central to, to this argument, the uh, uh, discussion on energy conservation and how it should be uh, uh, received by psychology. Uh, so the more the sharp monodox seems to have been highly inspired and motivated by those to progress, which the, which the author largely is taking the stance of interaction against parallelism. Many more interesting pieces were published at the time, but I'll skip to the work of uh, Ludwig Busse, an obs largely obscure nowadays philosopher who wrote it, interesting, also wrote a thesis on Spinoza, also on uh, psychophysical, on parallelism. Really. And he became a professor later in the University of Tokyo, Rostock, Münster, and finally Halle. And he died quite young, I think, uh, 40, mid 40. In 1900, he published a paper titled The Interaction uh, Between the Body and the Soul, Mind, and the Law of the Conservation of Energy. And the central question there was Does the conservation, I quote him, does the law of conservation of energy? Allow the assumption of an interaction between mind and, and between body and mind, or does it exclude and force us to assume psychophysical parallelism? As the title of this, the paper itself indicates, Busse argued for that the law of conservation allowed for a version of interactionism, while also maintaining that parallelism is contradictory and artificial for reasons similar to those articulated by Stumpf. And this paper was a, further articulated by him into a, another publication like this one. And this is a big book uh, of Guides to Court of Zero Life, which I'm, I yet have to tackle. But it basically develops a lot further uh, his, his views there. And I don't want to take more time on, on that. I'll just finish concluding here. Uh, I'm not yet completely able to pinpoint uh, the, the, the full argument that I, that I want to make here, or at least a, make a single take on, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to continue working on that and continue to engage in discussions here and later. But uh, on what's the take for German experimental psychologists? Uh, the energetic framework was used both by authors attempting to reduce the mind to underlying material exchanges, 
as well as by explicitly anti-materialistic projects. And some sites like Wounds that are described uh, in both ways by the same author. It was used by monists, dualists, interactionists, parallelists, and everything in between. As I try to highlight one key point or key element that is emerging from my, from my research is how it served the purpose of formulating the boundaries of psychology, boundaries between different types of psychology, boundaries between physiology and psychology, boundaries between the human and the natural sciences, and it's formulating the boundaries of the science as well as formulating the boundaries of the discipline itself. As the, part the, the, the disciplines become institutionalized, the different ways that they understand what the object is kind of informs the way that they uh, that they believe that the, the discipline should be organized and separated divided from the other uh, other disciplines. Uh, as Annette Rudberger was right there described in detail by the 1895 let's I'll say diagnostics of crisis had already started to emerge in psychology due to the perceived quick fragmentation of the discipline. Energy provided an important concept for authors as it allowed it uh, uh, as it allowed them on the one hand for psychology to be unified together with the other sciences while also maintaining its autonomy. So we could at the same time say that energy is a concept that has a continu continuum from physics to to physiology, to psychology, and continuing to, to sociology, and to the social, and to the spiritual, even, if you want. Uh, but at the same time, you can say, oh, no, but it's not the same side, the same energy. It's a psycho psychological specific energy. Uh, so it, it, it allows you to, I think, allow doctors to, to kind of, yeah unify the sciences while also maintaining some some autonomy. Uh, I think that's one interesting element. Then I'll stop here. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very run over. Yeah, it's not a problem. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, so thank you for the for the talk. Um, I still I still try to find uh, a bit what what are you heading at? What what is the aim? Because a uh, great part of what you presented is uh, based on good uh, secondary literature. Uh, so your idea is to find more about this uh, debate about parallelism and energy. Um, and I mean, it's clearly that these German authors. They're sharing uh, some common concepts and, and, and concerns. But to what extent can you isolate it from, uh, let's say, uh, authors such as Canon? I mean, they were also connected internationally. So, do, so on, how could, um, I wonder, the boundaries of your research, right? Mm -hmm. are not clear to me how you can isolate these researchers who were clearly also through the international conference connected internationally and influenced by each other, mm -hmm. right? Uh, from from the from the debates among uh, physiologists also on, a, on an international scale, and um, and what what is exactly the aim? Because depending with where you're heading, maybe the, I mean it's energy. First of all, the the first um, thing that I think is important to keep in mind is that the term energy refers to something that we cannot directly see, but we can measure indirectly, and this is. I think what what helps so much to to make it versatile also for talking in a, on a, on, a, on the invisible uh, sphere of the psychical or psychological energy. Then it's somehow linked also to spiritualism and all these energies that were like happening in these uh, the spirits uh, and the, then to homo homeostasis and the, and the body. So there are so many topics in, into that that I wonder. What is here you aim? Are you looking? What do you want to to develop this argument? Like saying they picked up uh, energy in order to distinguish psychological energy or psychical energy from physical to make this institutional uh, argument to say that's how we can uh, institutionalize psychology as a science 
independent from physiology? Is, is that what I'm, I'm truly trying to, to, to get a bit of a better idea of what you're having? Well, the, 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 the honest question is that I'm, I'm trying to figure that out as well myself, yes. <laughs> and uh, I, I think this is something that has emerged from reading, and it's not really just secondary sources, like reading the, the primary sources as well. And I think there's a lot of that that's in this year that I'm still have yet. So I, mean, I, I do want to get through all of it. Uh, but uh, what? Uh, well, I think my my leading question is exactly why why is this become such a useful concept for for uh, uh, such a ubiquitous concept at this period of time in psychology from and I'll say from. Yeah, 1860s to 1930s, I would say, it's like everywhere. Uh, pretty much every school of psychology, every author, the only one major author that I couldn't find anything at was Brent Dunham, uh, was talking about it, but like pretty much Abby uh, House, I don't know, name one, uh, Janet, William James, anyone. Uh, uh, what I'm so what, I mean I'm kind of led by that. Right? What's, why is it so? Right? What makes it so compelling that you have to engage with that? And why do they? How and why do they formulate such different concepts of energy? Uh, and the kind of debates that they are engaging with. I think the the other question that you're asking is why the emphasis on national, since it is international. Uh, I think the national becomes a, an initial angle to be able to do any research. Uh, I think it's not a it's not uh, uh, as you're saying like they're not working in isolation. There's a beginning here of like international congresses such as the, this congress in Munich. They had researchers from all over the world. They were reading each other's work, and I, and I, I do engage with that. But still, and I think I'm kind of quite influenced in that by uh, Mitchell Ash's uh, work on like how, you know, those initial practices of like institutionalization, they're very much informed by local as well debates and like but where exactly, how exactly, uh, um, how do you hire a psychologist, so to say? Yeah, how do, uh, the psychology becomes a proper de separate department, or is in the physiology, is in philosophy. In the German experimental setting, was in philosophy. They were all in the philosoph philosophy department. They were all philosophers, uh, chairs. That's that that's that's what they're hiring for. So I think, uh, as Mitchell Ash says, uh, that you know the pre the, the the motto of like uh, in the, uh, a German experimental uh, uh, German experimental psychology. But really to use the physiological method, the experimental method, to address the philosophical problems, the, the mind-body problem and free will <coughs> specifically. So they're all very inst instigated by that. When I get to Vienna and I study the neurophysiology, I think medical problems become a lot more prominent. And that's what I emphasize there, that they are dealing with questions a lot more of uh, disorder, uh, regulation, dysregulation, and they tend to use uh, those concepts much more to understand that. It's a very different question. They're, they're interlinked, and they're all kind of reading each other's words, but there's something. So I think I have to do a little bit of the national to then, I think that's my ultimate goal. So like, is to do like a more global and kind of like in cross boundaries more. So my, my ideal goal is to do Austria, Germany, uh, the US, England, and Sorry, Austria, Germany, US, uh, England, and France. Yeah. So, uh, and, and kind of like at the end, do a, a more comparative uh, uh, discussion. Thank you. So, uh, I hope I can have that uh, Yeah, thank you. I wanted to um, kind of jump off what uh, Annette was saying, what the answer that you've just given right now. Um, and I also had a question for you, but I was wondering, especially now that you're saying that you want to do this comparison, I think thinking about free will, I'm wondering if you're planning on bringing any elements of um, 
the definition of the liberal self and of politics into into how they might have been using the idea of free will because I think it's very much linked to the idea of citizenship who gets to you know who gets to have free will who doesn't how does this control you know how, how do we understand the masses all these kinds of issues that were happening at the time of, when you're um, of your research so I was just wondering if that's um, if you were thinking of looking into that uh, that was so that was one element and also another is um, if so I understand that you're quite interested in the use of energy um, and in relation to the definition of the, the boundaries of psychology, experiment, especially experimental psychology. Um, but have you looked into uh, the implications that these different debates had for different therapies of the mind um, and any dialogue that might have happened with, um, uh, with religion as well in that sense? Um, and how these ideas were actually like applied uh, for when well, you're talking about conservation of energy, how were people able to conserve their energy and not become sick? Uh, so the first is on liberalism and free will, and the yeah. second is on like religion and therapy, right? Yeah, yeah. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I actually I, I just submitted a paper for uh, Institute of Human Sciences on uh, Sigmund Axner and and uh, free will and uh, liberalism. It's called um, free, uh, Axner, Axner and Freud, maybe. Uh, and it's very much on that level. I think it's called, for example, uh, the, tale, the Tale of Huey Oedipuses. It's called in the next sense, Science, Liberalism, and the Universal Knower in, the, in, in both of the world. So, but, but yes, I think it will come up. Like it already comes up here. I'm, I'm picking up more on the mind body problem, but the free will is kind of pretty much comes together there. How to conceive of free will in, a, in this concept, in this idea of like there's a, co a closure causality in, of the world. Like, so they're trying to think <coughs> of that. It's, it is a central problem for them. Uh, uh, I, I, I think I can't do both. In one chapter, the, the way that I would like, I, I think I have, I have to focus a little bit, and I might have to do tackle free will into another. I think that there's a good chance that we can have the uh, British con uh, 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 context, uh, British authors, um, but it's just like a methodological choice here. I think uh, those two those two problems are the ones that really come to prominence. Uh, when you read uh, these German authors <coughs> at that time. Uh, a lot, I think a lot more even than the, the, the Austrian, even though I wrote about that in Exner, for example. So. Oh, the, the therapy, yeah. yeah. Uh, therapy, uh, it's already there in my, my first one, the one in the Austria, the one that I mentioned here, it's all about uh, problems of uh, disorder, like uh, mental disorder. Uh, uh, is how to conceive of, of that, like um, how energy is used. I would, and I argue that for Axner is a very much like a, a mechanistic way, and for Breuer is an anti-mechanistic. Like he brings, he calls himself a neo-vitalist, and he says that like his concept of the energy is is very much a a, a a replacement for the concept of vital energy or vital force. Uh, uh, he says that in letters. Uh, to Brentano. Uh, and and, and uh, all of that, does the question of fatigue emerge in the The fatigue, I, I know that it will emerge emerges in uh, uh, very clearly in Pierre Janet and very clearly in William James. Uh, for both of them, like uh, James has uh, the essay, The Energies of Man, in which he, you know, he not only discusses that in terms of fatigue, but he, he proposes a, a form of like a self therapy method for kind of tapping on special sources of uh, for sources of energy that one has in its own way like that are hidden sources of energy that would counter fatigue caused by modernity. Uh, so it's there. Uh, and it might come it, pro it probably come when I when I talk about well, both of these uh, authors. But yeah, it's very it's very central uh, for therapy. I mean, it's everywhere. It's like it becomes. It's, it's not like it's it's one it's focused on one topic. It's just a, like we use for everyone there at that time is using it for everything. Uh, it appears everywhere. Uh, if you once you start looking and you get it, like, uh, you, you you see. You're like if you write, start reading authors from that 
long time, pretty much every author views it in some way at some point. Uh, and in some, some authors will say that it's some, some it's a material, something that you can measure. Some try to measure like Heisch. Some will say that like, no, it's completely non-measurable. Uh, it's a hypothetical, uh, yeah, yeah. There's no one way. Sorry. Um, thanks for just a, just a very comprehensive and clear presentation. Um, I'd like to return back to Annette's question. In, sense, in terms of the local context, my sense when I was looking at this stuff um, was that in certain important respects, these debates were international before they were national, in the sense that the process of forming of institutions is going at various paces in various countries is a bit spotty in terms of this. And it's a sense where people are expecting others to read multilingually and are responding to debates across these languages. So English and French language contexts are basing themselves on the Jewish literature as well. And, and that. So it, it, it says that I think that it, it's important not to look at it as, in a way, national and then moving to a comparativism, but it's, it's as if like, there's an international discourse, because it's a conceptual one, that then becomes located and then becomes taken up in specific practices. And the well, second sense, in terms of uh, what these, my sense, and just excuse my recollection, because I've worked on this about 30 years ago, was that it's a science question, in a sense, it's like psychology has to have its energy concept to be a science. And then therefore, then the various definitions they're giving is, and it's part of how they are then framing and wanting to frame the discourse and the practice. But it, that's the question that one of the key drivers to to why energy, in my sense, of what you think of that. Uh, in the second one, uh, it, it, yeah, I, 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 I definitely agree, and I think. There is a, an analogous, there was an analogous uh, phenomena that I try to, I think a lot of my thinking on this, these concepts here also comes from reading the literature on the history of vitalism as well. Because uh, what the vitalists did in the 18th century uh, was to try to adapt uh, uh, Newtonian concepts of force, but but they had to think that like there was the of attraction and repulsion, but not everything can be, uh, not every phenomena can be uh, described purely in attractive repulsion, repulsive in terms of attractive and repulsive forces. Therefore, they have to come up with a type of force that's specific to light, and they come with the concept of force, different concepts of vital force. And I think there's something, but at the same time, you also had the proper mechanism. We're trying to conceive of the body in terms of exclusively forces of attraction or repulsion at that time. And I think there's something analogous going on here. You had you had authors who really tried to use the the concept of, of, of the concept of, of energy, very much aligned to Helmholtz. Uh, Helmholtz is always a big reference there, uh, and, and again, it already goes to your to your, uh, <coughs> to your point because Helmholtz is pretty much a reference to pretty almost everyone at that time. Uh, so they they try to use the concept of energy very much aligned to exactly how Helmholtz has used it. So they cannot formulate a concept of energy that specifically specific to psychology it has to be the same concept. No new forces. Uh, Sigmund Axen, for example, is exactly that. The concept of energy is very central in his, in his uh, project, but uh, uh, but it, the concept of energy is not a psychic energy. It's uh, the same energy. Yeah. Uh, but whereas other authors have have few force to find, they, they they have to create a concept of energy specific to to the science. And I think that's when you jump from the kind of vitalist, in a sense, uh, appropriation. Uh, and then going to the internationalizing, I don't know, this is, uh, if it's, if 
international first and local second. Sorry. I mean, certainly there's something global, and that's my interest. Global about the, the idea that like everyone at the same time is 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 uh, uh, using energy. So there's something that's yeah, they're all understanding that. But much like the discovery of, of energy conservation tended to happen, not necessarily caused by one another, but simultaneously. Right? It just happened just happened simultaneously because of similar conditions, I guess, uh, of ideas. And uh, and I, and I, I don't know. It's a, it's it's a it's a it's a thing I'm, I'm still working out for myself, as you can see that I can't. Uh, but it's a it's a it's a way of like how do, exactly do I organize this this project? Uh, I think there's something that's global and there's something that's local. Uh, and do I start with the local in terms of chapters, and then I go to the global, or do I start from the global, and then how do I separate them in chapters? And I make chapters that are based on themes rather than on places. I don't know. Uh, I decided to go from the local base. So pretty much, I think a lot of my argumentation then comes from Mitchell Ash. Like, and I, understand, I, 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 I tend to understand that, like, well, a lot of the psychology that was that was done in Vienna was done more in the physiology, was done by physiologists, and they had different sets of problems. And the one that was done in Germany was done by psychologists in the philosophy department, they had different sets of problems as well. To do. They met in conferences and they read each other's works, uh, they knew each other personally, or they exchanged letters and so on and so forth. So, to, so they are in, but they had certain sets of questions that were determined not only by them, but determined to a large extent also by, yeah, by their institutes, by the, the fabric of institutions at the time. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is, 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 I think Ash's work works really well for talking to the and the community that play also true. Hmm? Sorry? Works well for the and the third? Works very well for the like, 20s and 30s and the community that play the whole work. In the 1890s, I think the elephant in the room was not, and um, he, um, he he was the bugbear really in Leipzig for Wundt because Mach and Richard Avenarius were inspirational um, to um, the younger students. Kulpa was the institute assistant and was pushing this way of thinking to people like Titchener, right, who comes to America. So um, the idea that there cannot be any kind of homological metaphysical notion of energy, but it's more um, a way of processing a neo-empirical mm -hmm. uh, method. And Avenarius uh, does a whole abstract methodology on, on how that would work. They were very much into this. One hated it. He said, you can't have a program of experimentation unless you have a, a model sort of hypothesis to experiment with, at least, you know, work with a model and go from there. And these people were casting off. Mr. Berg did too, and he came to America. So it's Mach and um, Avenarius, I think, who you start with uh, in all this problem about uh, energy and about, uh, you know, what the psychological experiment is and can be. And then as far as energetics go, another fellow comes to Leipzig, uh, Wilhelm Oswald, uh, who has a whole philosophical program mm -hmm. that on uh, uh, energetics, I think they called it. Yeah. So it's a much, yeah. believe it or not, it's a bigger problem than even you, <laughs> even you have outlined here. Yeah. And uh, the the mock part is absolutely in their correspondence. It's almost as if one, um, you know, proscribed this and told them they could not read it, and so they all did. And then he complains that you know people like Stumpf and others encourage this kind of thinking. Kupa in Würzburg um, to uh, does this sound right, Anetta? Yeah. <laughs> this is this is kind of going back to the old school here, um, and I, I wouldn't forget that first step um, mm -hmm. when um, Mach brings what 
ultimately becomes this neo-positivistic way of looking at the um, at the um, um, fundamentals of all science, physics in particular, and this gives a kind of um, liberty, I will say, even to applied psychology and behavioristics eventually uh, in America that the early psychologists, and certainly Diltai, uh, were complaining about. Uh, so um, I love your bibliography there, uh, but I think there is a kind of a simple beginning to what became a complex articulation of ways of going about it and discussing the problem. There is a simple beginning that so Ma, Ma publishes that book on um, <coughs> analysis, <coughs> analysis. Sensation. No, another one too yeah. on um, uh, the the, the, um, the history of the notions of of energy and observation. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Both of those two. Yeah. Yeah, no, Mark is someone that has already, uh, he, keeps, he keeps appearing a lot, like, you know, I've already put back for that to some extent in my Vienna, Vienna paper. I mean, he appears a bit, but not much. Um, and I'm, I don't know, I just, this debate here turned and at the end of the century also it struck me as something new as I, as well to talk about because there's all this literature that uh, I found it quite interesting and very directly talking about the, the topic that had never been worked on or, or not much worked on so I found thought it was interesting to uh, 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 to to describe it. but yeah certainly I know that I that I have to get back to to Avenatti <coughs> uh, and Oswald is already in the mix as well I, I just have to focus as well uh, but uh, and especially my job here I have to specifically focus I like the bibliography very much yeah thank you uh, but yeah but Helmholtz I think uh, definitely Helmholtz I I think that, Mark was writing against Helmholtz. Yeah, but I think I think that Helmholtz is it's Helmholtz is the, the core figure that appears for everyone, uh, and then and then uh, yeah, there are others. Fashioner uh, second, and perhaps then Mark. Okay, any more? <laughs> so I have, I have a question that oh, I you don't really <laughs> had the, the panel just for me. <laughs> I don't, I don't even know entirely how to, how to formulate my question uh, because I guess it, it, it comes back to the local versus international, maybe to say where it's coming from, which is my own uh, ongoing for the last 15 years problem of um, uh, I've, been, I've been trying to work on French vitalism uh, in particular, mm -hmm. and kind of the uh, in French physiology, and, and, and I stopped in 1860, so that also sets kind of the, the framework. Mm -hmm. So a lot of different sorts of problems, but uh, in terms of is it better to start with the national or the national level, I can say at least for the case of France, even though ideas even earlier uh, circulated, uh, were debated, that there were very, very specific um, structures in which, institutional structures uh, in which physiology was practiced that influenced uh, the way uh, the way the French were, were interested in um, uh, forces, mm -hmm. vital forces, mm -hmm. vitalism, and the question of what is life or what makes life specific. Uh, and French vitalism was very, very different from journal, German vitalism that I, I really don't know as well, so mm -hmm. I can't make a huge pronunciation on that. But, but I, think that, I think that if you start, if you look at the physiology from the prism of psychology, you get a very different picture than what I've been doing, <laughs> which is looking from the perspective of physiology and how a lot of psychological questions get 
progressively eliminated from the, the French uh, physiology. So um, I guess one thing is a comment that mm -hmm. please continue because I want somebody to solve this sort of problem that's, that's, that, that I find very, very difficult. Um, and, and I guess the more specific question is, um, or maybe uh, agreement with, with what you said, that the, these local contexts, at least in the earlier periods, seem very, very important in terms of what's even meant by uh, these concepts that when they circulated uh, or when they were discussed uh, could have had very, very different meanings in these different contexts, at least if you compare with France, which is the one thing that I, that I can kind of say something about. Uh, now, now I'm going to like the very speculative and like uh, and uh, I'm going a little bit more wild here. So, if, and, and this is some something that I kind of presented a bit. But if you try to do like a really long history instead of doing a more micro history or like local history, uh, yeah, micro history, more more like if you try to go a longer history of of energy and force. You have a, a history whereby like there, was, there, there were concepts that were all encompassing and that progressively they got reduced uh, to kind of become like these abstract forces then of attraction and repulsion. So by which uh, you, you see like the, what what happened in, in a in a vitalist tradition was uh, on, before with Newtonianism is like. You kind of removed the the life from the concept of force, and you remove everything vital, remove everything mental as well, and you reduce just to this uh, to attraction and repulsion. So then the vitalists come and they do a concept that brings everything vital but eliminates everything mental. At the same time, uh, you have both making creating specifically. Mental forces. So we have the uh, the vis uh, representativa uh, is a specifically a mental force at exactly, at exactly the same time. And uh, as uh, Fernando Vidal put in his book, like the the, the vitalists, then they they take uh, Volkian psychology and they make they put it into the encyclopedia kind of like in a sort of shifted way. So you have this history of kind of, as, as you push it out, like you create, you create a new concept around it, and at, at the same happened, I think, with energy as a concept. Uh, and this is my speculation that I'm trying to do. Like if I try to do a long history, that's kind of a little bit how, how I would see. Uh, because I think there's a, yeah, there's a local history that is just like from the law of energy conservation to you know, the discovery 1840, to psychology, but there's a there's a there's a long, much longer history before that, and the history before that is that the, the creation of attempt of uh, uh, energy conservation was an attempt to unify and to unify uh, this concept by, in a certain way, suppressing all these other uh, very militantly. If you read uh, the Guajimol, if you read. Uh, uh, Meyer or Helmholtz was very militant about how that no other forces other than attraction and repulsion shall be specific, so militant against vital forces and so on and so forth. Uh, so what they're doing is like really I think an attempt to you know, suppression of these concepts, which are then remerge again in terms of psychical energy, physical uh, uh, vital energy, and so on and so forth. Kind of like a little bit how I understand, even though this is a, a year, uh, yeah, very off the off the books. I don't know how you feel right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Is that it? Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.